Hello, I'm Zonal Fit and welcome to another video on the TechQuest. Today's video is going to be a little shorter than my usual ones, but I wanted to do this before I added in a graphics card to the Ultra 7 265K. You see, the core Ultra 7 265K isn't a bench testing processor, it's my processor in my main PC, so I need it ready to use for my purposes sooner rather than later. I'm going to summarise the 265K today rather than going to my usual depth. But the 265K is a 20 core, 20 thread processor on socket LGA 1851. Of those 20 cores, 8 are performance cores and 12 are efficiency cores. That's right, there's no hyperthreading on these processors. Of particular interest today though, and the focus of this video, is the integrated graphics that comes with this processor. Featuring 4 XE cores based on similar architecture as you'll find in the Arc B580, Intel have made incredible strides with integrated graphics in recent times. Gone are the days when Intel graphics would only light up your monitor. This thing can actually game. I've paired my 265K up with 32 gigs of DDR5 6000 memory. It's an average speed for DDR5, but I bought it for a bargain price, which was my primary motivator here. It will no doubt be replaced when higher speed DDR5 starts coming down in price. Here's the full specifications of the system I'm using today, complete with the latest drivers for the graphics. GPU-Z says I'm using older drivers, but I did update to Arc 6989 after this screenshot was taken. I spent an afternoon playing a small but demanding selection of games, so let's get to it. Fallout 4 is first, at 1080p and using the game's medium preset. This was overall okay, but did have some minor frame rate issues on the iGPU. It was playable, but a little bit inconsistent, especially when you hit Diamond City. Issues I think are more driver related, as the performance is often there, but with consistency problems. Average was 52.9 FPS, with percentile figures coming in at 29.6 FPS for 1%, and 13.4 for 0.1%, which is certainly where the problems are. Spider-Man drops in the testing here, and what can I say? This is genuinely impressive performance. At 1080p and using the low preset, Spider-Man was a solid, consistent experience on the Archi GPU, and even the percentile figures were excellent here, considering we are running off onboard graphics. You could nudge your resolution down a notch if that 60 FPS is really important to you, but this was more than good enough in my opinion. Average was 50.4, with good percentile numbers too, 1% at 34, and 0.1% at 28.1. Impressive stuff. Grand Theft Auto Enhanced is next. I actually forgot to dial the settings down a bit here, but I decided I'd run with it anyway. At 1080p very high, the onboard graphics impressed again, delivering a fairly consistent 30 FPS result with very minor deviations downwards on occasion. Tweak the settings here and get better performance at lower graphical fidelity, or just enjoy GTA 5 looking fancy at 1080p. It's really your preference. The average came in at 33 FPS, with 27.2 and 26.4 for the 1% and 0.1% figure respectively. Red Dead 1 is another solid performer here. At 1080p and using the game's medium preset, the onboard graphics put in another good shift. With an average of 48.1 FPS, Red Dead was overall a good experience, and that frame rate mostly held when you hit the towns too. Like the previous two games, Red Dead's consistency was fantastic, and those percentile figures were once again excellent relative to overall performance, 1% at 40.3, with 0.1 at 37.6. Let's up the ante a little bit. Horizon Forbidden West, a 720p low with XESS enabled. It's not the prettiest at these settings, but once again the Archi GPU is fairly consistent with its delivery, and we saw a mostly 30fps return with the occasional drop. It was still very playable, albeit at low settings, but it's impressive nonetheless. Average was 31.8, with the percents coming in at 23.3 and 18.9 for 1 and 0.1%. Not bad at all. Dying Light was easy work here. At 1080p and using the medium preset, Dying Light was fantastic overall, with solid figures all around. I played this one for about 20 minutes and I had a good time. It's a great experience, backed up by fantastic numbers. Average at 75.1, with percentile figures being 60 for 1% and 57.4 for 0.1%. What about Dying Light 2 then? A bit more challenging a task, but the 265K mostly managed it, although it wasn't at the same level we have so far enjoyed. At 720p medium, with XESS enabled, Dying Light 2 managed an average 32.5 FPS, with 1% coming in at 23.5 FPS. 0.1% was an issue, and you could feel it as you played it too, at 3.3 FPS. You'll get by fine of course, but performance isn't perfect here. You can't win them all. Frostpunk ran perfect at 720p low, with a solid 60 FPS presentation with very little deviation. New Vegas also ran pretty well, for New Vegas, at 1080p ultra, as you would expect. When I started it up, the Division 2 gave me a hardware requirements warning, but it might as well not have bothered. At 1080p low, the 265K managed this one absolutely fine too, and it was a good overall performer, 
that carried into the percentile figures as well. Average was 52.1, with 1% of 41.1 and 0.1% of 36.1. Great overall, and you could always drop that resolution a notch to get to 60 FPS. Cyberpunk 2077 is our penultimate game, and the first one that didn't really feel very playable. A 720p medium, with XESS enabled, Cyberpunk came in at an average 27.9 FPS, with dips below 30 FPS frequent when you are driving around Night City. On the ground combat saw above 30 FPS, and maybe dropping some more settings would see that overall number improve. It's hard to tell with Cyberpunk though, but we are pretty close to that 30 FPS mark that you might be able to get by like this in a pinch. And finally, Red Dead Redemption 2. A 720p medium with ultra textures, Red Dead 2 ran absolutely fine. It actually performs better here than on my Ultra 7 based MSI Claw, which is entirely down to the architecture improvements Intel have made in one generation. I had absolutely no problems here, and this is reflected in the more than decent numbers. Average at 40.6, with a percents at 34.7 and 33.1 FPS, meaning you're in for a great time here, no matter where you go. And that's a wrap. The Ultra 265K's onboard graphics are really impressive, but what is more impressive is how consistent the 265K is overall in its delivery. With few exceptions, percentile numbers were fantastic, right across the board, and this translates to the most important thing of all, your experience being good. Being realistic, no one is buying an Ultra 265K to play on the onboard graphics that come with this processor. This is going to be paired with a dedicated GPU that removes the iGPU from the equation, but you can play your games, even demanding ones at realistic settings, with everything on the chip. Add in even faster memory and watch performance increase with that too. There was a time that Intel onboard graphics used to be a meme, but that meme has been put out to pasture. I've been Zonoff here, thanks for watching this shorter video on the TechQuest. Until next time, bye bye.